In a dimly lit corner of the ballroom, I watched a couple gracefully gliding across the dance floor. Their eyes were glued to each other. They were having a silent conversation. The woman's chest rose and fell with each step, and her partner pulled her closer than she expected. Her slender figure perfectly matched his large one, creating a stunning contrast. Their movements were elegant and smooth, like in a choreographed dance. He moved with the agility of an athlete, and she followed his every move with precision. All eyes in the room were riveted on them, mesmerized by the emotional connection that seemed to radiate between them. It might not be love, but there was something undeniably strong about the way they moved together. The bond between them went beyond simple friendship. Her honey-blonde locks cascaded like a light tide and moved as she leaned towards him, but not of her own free will. She was held tightly by her attractive boss. Watching them together, I couldn't help but feel a pang of jealousy. After 11 years of marriage, the sight of my wife in his arms made me angry and humiliated. Attending the annual awards and appreciation banquet at her company has become a kind of tradition for us. It was no secret to everyone who worked there that she was my wife. As we all sat and watched the performance, I felt eyes searching for me in the crowd, anticipating some kind of skirmish. After a few dances, they left the dance floor together, joining other colleagues at a table in the center of the hall. I couldn't help but notice how she was looking at him with a familiar intensity in her eyes, a look that had previously been intended only for me. I hadn't seen them for a very long time, but the disgust inside me was still strong. All I could think about was that the inevitable was coming. The tension was building up, like in a kettle that is about to boil. I needed to hold on a little longer. The attempt to balance fear, anger, and bitterness towards the current situation with the love, admiration, and faith that I once felt for my wife turned out to be unsuccessful. Despite all my efforts, I couldn't get rid of these conflicting emotions. But as I watched her walk away without deigning to look at me, I was overwhelmed by a wave of despair and self-pity. I hung my head, feeling defeated after all the efforts I had put in to try to fix our broken marriage. Despite my countless attempts to arrange dates, do household chores, have meaningful conversations and make romantic gestures, she continued to distance herself. The flowers, notes and love cards I left for her were thrown away without a second thought. Even sending flowers to her workplace did not elicit any response from her. Standing behind Marianne at the makeshift bar in the corner of the room, I couldn't help but wonder if my wife had received the flowers I sent. Now all I had to do was wait. Pushing these thoughts out of my head, I tried to keep an impassive look and asked Marianne if she was having fun. She mentioned that Harold likes free drinks at these annual parties, and I couldn't help but smile and nod in agreement. I reached for my empty glass, repeating Marianne's actions. Me too, I replied absently. The absence of Jason's wife, who always brought elegance and joy to our conversations, did not go unnoticed. Have I seen Jason's wife today? I asked, trying to hide my concern. Marianne leaned towards me, her words slightly blurred from the alcohol. Oh, didn't Kells mention that? Jason handed his wife the divorce papers today. It seems like she was neglecting her marital duties. Marianne's revelation hit me like a brick. But it seems that due to intoxication, she did not pay attention to the weight of her words. I was pleasantly surprised by the results. After all, it's Friday night. As soon as I got home from work, we rushed here without even having time to really discuss anything. Perhaps I exaggerated a little when I said that we took the day off to prepare for the evening. She had plenty of opportunities to raise this issue, but she decided not to. I poured myself another whiskey and coke, picked up a glass of white wine for Kelsey, and headed over to the table where she and Jason were chatting. They were so engrossed in each other that none of them noticed my approach. Kelsey, I brought you a glass of wine, I said, handing her the glass. She jumped slightly in surprise and exclaimed, Oh, you scared me! She took the glass from me and thanked me, but the awkward tension in the room was palpable. The others tried to avoid eye contact, 
showing a sudden interest in the stained tablecloth or something else on the other side of the room while we stood there feeling awkward. I caught curious glances from those around me, expressing doubt in my thoughts and obvious ignorance. A young man, no older than 25, was openly grinning as he watched me look at the table. Our eyes met for a moment, maintaining a silent connection, after which his smile faded and he turned his attention to the tablecloth. The clock was ticking, approaching one o'clock in the morning, which meant the end of the holiday, and the guests began to leave the hotel lobby, heading home. It was obvious that Kelsey wasn't quite ready to finish the dance with her partner. We should probably go home, dear. I still need to drop off the babysitter, and we promised her that we wouldn't go out later than two today, I said, realizing that I was taking up her time spent with Jason. Okay, I think we should go. See you on Monday, she replied with a smile. It was nice to know that this awkward moment was coming to an end for everyone involved. It was nice to see you, Jason. I held out my hand and he met it with a firm handshake. Despite the fact that he was trying to demonstrate his strength through his grip, I can say that I have a physical advantage. I was a little taller and heavier than him. While maintaining eye contact, I sensed a hint of deception and complacency in his gaze. After a moment, he let go of my hand and wished us good night. I said goodbye to the group as we left the room and headed for the car. The ride home was quiet, but Kelsey's beaming smile lit up the darkness. Upon arriving home, Kelsey immediately went to check on our daughter Caitlin, and I took care of Brittany and prepared to take her home. When I returned, I found Kelsey already sound asleep in bed. After checking on Caitlin, I quickly went to the bathroom and then retired to a spare room for the night. I already knew that there could be no intimacy between us today. It's been so long since we've been in each other's arms. I closed my eyes, the ceiling image disappeared, and I fell asleep, while my mind was busy with tasks that I needed to solve the next day. When I woke up early on Saturday morning, I found Caitlin already in the living room, engrossed in her favorite cartoon. I waved at her from the doorway, asking if she had already had breakfast. Yes, she replied enthusiastically, waving a spoon dipped in milk and accidentally sprinkling drops on the carpet. I reminded her to calm down because mom is still asleep and I have to work in the office. Okay, dad, she replied too loudly, making me giggle at her rampage. Around 8.30 a.m. on Saturday, I contacted my lawyer on my cell phone. Good morning, Bill. This is Matthew Franks, I greeted him. Good morning, Matt. I think it's not a happy call, he replied, already guessing the reason for my appeal. Confirming his suspicions, I informed him. That's right. It's time to put the plan into action. I found out that Jason filed for divorce yesterday. Do you think Kelsey met with a lawyer? Bill replied, I don't think so, but I'll contact her and clarify. Let's meet in 30 minutes at the coffee shop. My assistant will ask you to sign and date the notarized forms. We'll file the paperwork on Monday morning and then we'll serve her at lunch, Bill suggested. Good plan. See you soon, I said. I arrived at the coffee shop early. Greeting the barista with a faint smile, I ordered and settled into a cozy armchair by the fireplace. My thoughts were in the air as I reflected on the unexpected turn my life had taken. I never thought that I would divorce the only true love of my life. It's hard to pinpoint the exact moment when you realize that your cozy life is about to change, but you can make an assumption. For me, it was a traffic ticket. One of those annoying fines that a camera issues for running a red light. The photo showed the driver, the license plate of the car, as well as the date and time of the violation. When I received the fine in the mail, I grinned and immediately realized that it was Kelsey's doing. When she was in a hurry, she always turned on the headlights. I hesitated before opening the message, knowing that the only reaction to it would be tears. A direct encounter with this situation would only lead to trouble. In the photo, Kelsey was sitting next to a man whose face was hidden. Even though I couldn't make out his features, I recognized him immediately. It would seem that the usual moment is perhaps they are having lunch or going to a meeting. But something about the date and time, 
March 5 have alerted me. Not so long ago, I was flipping through my phone when I came across our text messages from the 5th. She planned to stop by Mary's place after work to buy clothes for Kate. It seemed like a common thing because Mary's daughter was a little older, and we often received nice gifts from them. Although I usually remembered Mary bringing things to work, I didn't think much of it at the time. Don't worry. Do you want me to cook dinner? I asked. Yes, she replied. What time should I wait for you? Well, I think I'll be a little late, she replied. Okay, let's have some fun there. Thank you, we'll take care of it, she said with a smile. At that time, I found an intersection on Google Maps that was on the other side of the city from Mary's house. But maybe it's just a coincidence, right? As I put all the evidence together, it became increasingly difficult for me to ignore the signs. Kelsey had been lying low since November, and our quarrels over the holidays were becoming more frequent. By January, she stopped being interested in how I hold her hand when we go shopping or walk together. Our conversations gradually turned to work, or Caitlin, leaving behind the scenes the discussion of our aspirations, family vacations, and plans for the future. I was lucky that since childhood I had a trust fund, which arose thanks to my great-grandfather's wise investment in undeveloped lands in the Pacific Northwest. As the city expanded, he sold some of the land back to the community, and after his death, I inherited the fruits of his visionary decisions. Initially, hundreds of thousands of dollars were invested in the fund, which continued to grow after my grandfather's death. Due to the self-sufficiency of my family, I have never had to use this fund. The balance of funds remained stable and even increased slightly over time due to accrued interest. After the death of my father and mother, I inherited all their property and easily combined it with my own investments. Despite the accumulated wealth, the three of us were on the verge of settling down for life. But Kelsey and I decided to keep working and increase our wealth in the run-up to retirement. When we got married, I took care of signing a prenuptial agreement to secure our funds. Over the years, we have regularly updated the prenuptial agreement and wills. One of the points that never changed was the standard divorce clause, ensuring that in the event of a divorce, our assets would remain divided. In the event of my death or divorce, special provisions have been developed regarding the circumstances of my death. Kelsey wouldn't have gotten any benefits if she had been involved in my demise. To ensure fairness and protection, I have been using the legal and financial services of a reliable family lawyer for many years. While preparing for a possible divorce, I turned to a lawyer for advice, and I was referred to the best local divorce lawyer. I set up a meeting with them at the end of the week to discuss possible options, knowing that our prenuptial agreement would be a solid foundation for any legal proceedings. I wasn't worried about my finances. I told him that I wasn't ready to make any serious decisions yet, but I just wanted to get advice on what to do next. Matt, one option is to hire a private investigator to figure out the situation and find out if there is cause for concern. Unfortunately, all my detectives are busy with other cases right now, so it may take several weeks before they can take on yours. I understand that you are worried and don't want to wait, so let's consider other possibilities, the lawyer said. There is one person who fits this description. He's trying to start from scratch, but few people believe in him. We call him Larry the Nasty. Bill told me about him that he is a former police officer who was fired for various complaints and suspicious behavior. Although he can be hired right away, I hesitate to approve a long-term collaboration with him. Why the nickname Scoundrel? I asked, grinning. I prefer to keep everything under control. If we are to move forward, it is important to have concrete evidence. Fortunately, he does not go beyond the law. He is able to collect information such as detailed photos, videos, emails, and phone calls that may go beyond what is allowed by law. I was informed that his findings often serve as indisputable proof of infidelity, the lawyer says. We could offer him a payment to complete our business with him and move on to a more reliable private investigator over the next few weeks, he suggested. I thought for a moment. Do you think he can start working for us today? I asked. 
I will contact him to confirm this. I will act as an intermediary in this situation in the office. I'll give you the latest news later today, Bill offered. Sounds like a plan, thanks, I said. I filled out various forms for the lawyer and the person, submitted them to my accountant, and deducted the fee from a separate business account, not from my personal one. Kelsey didn't know what I was up to because she didn't have access to the information. I didn't want to alarm her, especially if my suspicions turned out to be unfounded, because our marriage was already going through hard times. During this period, I decided to work on improving my relationship with my wife. Thanks to my life experience, I realized that sudden changes in behavior usually occur after some significant event. Not knowing what caused these changes in my wife, and not being sure that our relationship could not be fixed, I decided to try anyway. I made a conscious decision to make our relationship a priority by assuming the role of a caring and attentive partner. I devoted myself to showing my love and appreciation for her, striving to become the kind of husband her friends would envy. Despite my efforts, it became clear that our relationship had reached a breaking point. On Thursday afternoon, I was asked to stop by Bill's office to discuss our next steps. The detective discovered a treasure trove of evidence. Hours of video footage captured them together in intimate moments, portraying a happy couple. Photos, phone records, and personal emails painted an eerie picture. Watching what was happening, I was torn between admiration for the cunning of the villains and disgust at their betrayal. The nickname they had earned seemed too appropriate. I sat there not believing that everything was like that. I never would have thought that such a thing was possible. Trying to figure out what could have attracted her to him, I couldn't help but pay attention to his physical characteristics. Tall, handsome, well-built. He was well-educated and progressed confidently both in his career and in his personal life. About a year ago, he took over Kelsey's department, having previously worked as her personal assistant. His close working relationship with Kelsey allowed him to integrate into her life. Jason was an outstanding baseball player in college and planned to go to graduate school, but a shoulder injury sustained in his senior year forced him to change direction. It was hard not to be impressed by his success. I never thought Kelsey would let him come between us. The situation was too complicated. I felt suffocated, my chest was constricted, and my vision was blurred. I was afraid that I might lose consciousness. Desperate for relief, I pushed back my chair and bent over, pressing my head between my knees, trying to even out my breathing. Inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale, until consciousness clears. The feeling of loss and emptiness was indescribable. I just lost my beloved my partner, my lover, and the mother of our child. At that moment I felt trapped, and then it only got worse. Bill turned on a recording made the day before, in which Jason talks about his desire for them to be together. Do you really love me? Her voice was full of anticipation. Yes, my dear. You are the epitome of perfection. I adore you, and I dream that we will create a family. So you, me and Caitlin? Absolutely. What do you think of Matt and Shannon? She asked. Let's divorce them. You'll get Caitlin, and we can start living a happy family. The conversation fell silent while Kelsey digested the shocking news she had received from her partner. You really love me, don't you, Kels? He asked. Yes, of course, she replied. I've never thought about leaving Matt before. We'll just think about it, he urged. He will never be able to give you what I can give. You will become the beauty of any ball, a part of high society. We will have the opportunity to visit such places and experience things that he could not even dream of. I heard the contempt in his tone and imagined the expression on his face when he uttered these words. The thought of losing Kate devastated me. My daughter is my whole world. I will be a much better father than this loser who can't even hope. After a year, she won't even want to visit him, Jason said. Why do you despise him so much? What did he do to you? There was a hint of concern in her voice. To be honest, I was curious too. He's not worthy of you, Kelsey, he replied simply. 
This man is devoid of ambition and shows no interest in going beyond his current position. He seems content to be a simple hard worker contributing to someone else's wealth, Jason said. Did you know that he holds the position of factory director? His factory employs 400 people and has achieved the highest production and profit per square foot compared to other factories. I was pleased to hear that Kelsey knew about this, although I would have preferred this conversation to take place in a more appropriate setting, such as in their dining room. In my opinion, he looks weak-willed and not assertive enough, he replied. A beta male, devoid of drive and ambition in school, unable to get an MBA, who has served his time, is easily trampled into the mud any day of the week, he continued mockingly. Jason, don't kid yourself that you're taller than Matt. He is not a weakling. His early life is unknown to you. He hung out with bad people, was good with guns, and almost turned down a dark path until he finally decided to pursue education. This revelation seemed to make her feel proud. He's stronger and more resilient than you think. Please assure me that you will not engage in physical combat with him. I don't want any of you to get hurt. He's thinking about Kate, and you're thinking about me. I can't deny my feelings for him. I wish things were different, but you took his place as my partner, my love. She paused, considering the logic of the situation. How will all this happen and when? What is it? She asked. We will end our marriages at the same time. I need to make some preparations before I officially file for divorce from Shannon, he replied. Given her psychiatric problems and lack of intimacy in the last year, it won't be difficult to split everything equally. She's unlikely to protest, Jason said. Of course, but first you need to start the divorce process with Shannon. She was careful preferring stability rather than risking her current lifestyle, even for the sake of the man she truly loved. Okay, now come here, my dear, he said. I asked to stop recording because I didn't need to listen to it anymore. Turning to Bill, I asked, what should I do? He advised me to take the first step, but I expressed concern that he might change his mind. Bill reassured me by saying that this was unlikely as they had reached the point where nothing could change their minds. For the first time, I watched the detective closely. A man in his thirties, in good shape, athletic, impeccably dressed in a well-fitting suit. It wasn't what I expected at all. He was polite and didn't seem to have made a mistake in his assessment, I realized. Gradually, I began to perceive him as Larry and not as an insidious person. I felt that he was genuinely pursuing my interests despite the fact that I was the one paying the bill. He looked worried and shocked by the behavior and words of the other two people. Would you really like to get it now, knowing what you know? Larry asked. You're probably right, Larry, I agreed, and turned to Bill. Give me a day or two to think about it and I'll call you, okay? That sounds good, Matt, Bill replied. Do I need to start describing the outline of the document and then add details or should I stop the process if necessary? The lawyer asked. Let's focus on the first option, I replied. Larry came over and handed me his business card. Here's my personal number, Mr. Franks. Don't hesitate to contact us if you need anything, he suggested. Please just call me Matt, I replied. Thanks, Matt, Larry replied. I know some people who can help you in your quest for revenge if you choose this path. It's not for nothing that I have such a nickname, he added with a grin. It was nice to meet you, Larry. If I need help, I will definitely contact you. I really appreciate your offer. Although I don't think I can go through with it and hurt Kelsey, it's nice to know that I have a friend to turn to if I change my mind, I replied. Larry smiled and waved goodbye as he headed for his car. The decision weighed on me all weekend. It was hard for me to focus on anything else, and Kelsey didn't seem to notice that I was thinking about the future of our family. It dawned on me that she might have already made a decision for all of us. I was filled with doubts, anger, fear, and disappointment. The most painful thing was the humiliation and the feeling of losing a sense of masculinity. My whole personality revolved around my job and my family. Who would I be without them? 
The thought of Caitlyn moving on to the next chapter without me bothered me a lot. And the thought of this arrogant man raising my daughter made me furious. I imagined him walking my daughter down the aisle on her wedding day. My emotions were in a complete mess, and no amount of alcohol could bring me clarity. It wasn't until Sunday morning, sitting on the back porch of the house and wincing from a headache, that I realized that I was most likely going to lose my wife. Despite all my attempts to resist, I saw the contempt in her eyes and realized that I had already lost my family. Now it only remained to determine how and under what circumstances I would lose everything. Suddenly a familiar saying came to mind, lead, follow, or get out of the way. I did not want to retreat and did not want to blindly follow these treacherous people, and I had only one way out, to take responsibility and lead. On Monday morning, I called Bill to discuss our situation. Hi Bill, it's Matt Franks calling, I said. Good morning Matt, have you made any progress in solving the problem? Yes, I have a plan, I need you to fill out all the necessary paperwork including the legal photos that Larry sent. We'll split it 50, 50, I explained. There was a short silence after which he asked, Are you offering to sell the house? I confirmed, Yes. We used a low interest loan from my trust fund to buy it, essentially paying ourselves. Any profit we receive will be divided equally. I will pay off the entire loan amount along with the interest that we have accumulated over the years. In addition, I will transfer $200,000 to Kelsey from my trust as a token of gratitude. Perhaps this gesture will soften her attitude, because she will know that she will not be left completely without means of livelihood. I am determined to get primary custody of Kate. Although I understand the difficulties that await me, perhaps Larry will be able to reveal compromising information about Jason that will cast doubt on his suitability as the father of a little girl, I said. I heard that he was a popular fraternity member in college. Perhaps he let his success turn his head. I hope Larry can talk to him about it. I have a backup plan for Kate. If we fail to obtain primary custody, please draw up as detailed a joint custody agreement as possible. I paused briefly to give Bill a chance to remember. In addition, I am considering suing Jason for emotional alienation and involving his wife Shannon in the situation. I want her to be aware of the situation. As for her, I want you to come up with a new divorce plan based on her cheating. I'm willing to pay for it. She deserves to be held accountable for her actions, I said angrily. We can hand the papers to both of them in a separate room, but I know that won't solve all the problems, Bill said. I also need her to sign a contract with me, I added. I can start filling out the necessary forms even without her cooperation, I can do a lot, Bill detailed. I understand, I just want to stir things up a bit. I want to file a lawsuit against Kelsey's company for allowing her to enter into a relationship with her boss. I am concerned that there are no moral standards in the company that would prevent such behavior, especially given the dynamics of power in relations with her immediate superior. I understand that this may not lead to any significant consequences, but it is important to resolve this issue and see what can be done," I added. Matt. Be prepared for potentially high costs and increased costs while we resolve this issue," Bill warned me. I have to make sure that these two don't get more money than they are rightfully owed. As my father always said, when you hire a lawyer, you're essentially negotiating a price, I finished. Bill laughed at my sarcastic comment about lawyers, agreeing that my father was wise. Remember, you don't have to give her the funds from your trust thanks to a secure prenuptial agreement, he reminded. I know about it, Bill. After thinking about it over the weekend, I came to the conclusion that without burdening her financially, I could make her more supportive of my requests. And frankly, she deserves it. She put in a lot of effort and supported me while we both saved money for the future. I hoped it would give her an advantage over Jason, and she wouldn't have to depend on him so much when she was on her own. She really deserves better. But I'm not going to let that liar Jason take more from me than he's already taken. I grimaced as I expressed my thoughts. 
feeling that my wife should have been all I needed. Just the thought of Jason taking over the life that I thought should have been mine made me despair. Even though I felt betrayed by Kelsey, I always tried to be honest with her and treat her with respect, even if it wasn't mutual. I found comfort in the certainty that Caitlin would eventually understand and support my decisions when she saw how our family had suffered. I am refraining from submitting an application for now. I prefer everything to be ready and waiting in the wings. I want to wait for her to take the initiative. This way I can spend more time with Kate at our family home. I understand that there will come a moment when I will have to act, but I want to wait until the very last moment when I can't handle it anymore, I told Bill. I see. We can leave all documents unsigned and notarized until you feel ready. I can work from home on Saturday mornings so you can contact me on the weekend, Bill informed me. We won't be able to file the documents until Monday morning but I can arrange for someone to be at the doors when they open and submit them the same day, Bill suggested. Okay, we'll do that, I agreed. After saying goodbye, I took Larry's business card out of my pocket and dialed the number. Larry replied, Matt Franks, how are you? Okay. I replied. Are you ready for mischief? I hesitated. Yes, but please wait for my signal, okay? No problem. What do you need to know? He asked. Can we arrange a personal meeting? I asked. Sure, just give me an hour. That sounds good, I replied. I was already waiting for him to pull up to the parking lot. After drinking coffee and having a snack, he sat down opposite me. I want to collect all the unpleasant files, photos, videos, recordings, everything. We need to figure out how to anonymously send this to Shannon Stanton, maybe by email, I explained. No problem. I know someone who works on the dark web, Larry said before ending the conversation. I was thinking about posting a video on an adult website or sending inappropriate messages to Kelsey's parents or colleagues, Larry suggested. He's cunning, I thought to myself. But Kelsey will still have to stay in town. I don't want her to be so ashamed that she left with Kate, and she's still dear to me, even if she doesn't feel that way about me anymore. I pushed an envelope with $5,000 in cash towards Larry. This should help you get started, but if you need more just let me know, I said. Larry took the money and nodded at me. $3,000 should be enough, Larry said. Despite his harsh temper, he is at least straightforward. You can keep the remaining amount as an advance payment. I may need your special skills in the future. Don't forget to be careful until I get in touch with you. I want to surprise them, and I have specific motives so that they can take the first action. In addition, we should collect information about his wife's health problems. Her medical background may influence our future decisions. Are you up to the task? I asked. Absolutely, he replied. Bill asked me to gather information about how Jason went to school. I need something that I can use against him if we get caught up in a custody battle, he said. I nodded in understanding and made a few notes in my notebook. After finishing our coffee, we discussed his career in law enforcement and all our mutual acquaintances. After completing the meeting, we shook hands and went our separate ways. That was three months ago. My thoughts were interrupted by the appearance of Bill accompanied by his assistant and Larry. Is it time to leave? Bill asked when everyone had taken their seats. Yes, it looks like it, Larry replied. We're not sure if Kelsey has already consulted with a lawyer, Bill said. I didn't see anything in her email, I quickly added after Bill's call. I'll check again today and get an answer by Monday morning, I said. Larry grinned and gave me a mischievous wink. What about Jason? Does he have any skeletons in his closet? I asked, anticipating the gossip. Oh, definitely, Larry confirmed. Together with his fraternity, he was under investigation on charges of committing a crime. Harassment with the use of illegal drugs of girls at parties. I was given copies of the evidence, which I immediately handed over to Bill. Bill looked at me, nodded, and said he was keeping them in case he needed them at a custody hearing. Pulling out the documents we had been working hard on for the past few months, he led me to the signature line. After signing, Bill's assistant notarized the document, 
and I turned to the group, in particular to Larry. Could you find out who Shannon Stanton hired as a lawyer and tell Bill about it? If he is competent, could you share our legal file with him? I asked. Bill asked about the lawyer's competence, to which we replied that if he was not suitable, then we would find a way to contact Shannon directly. Larry and I agreed that it might not be worth sending a third party. Larry nodded, sipping his coffee, and Bill turned to us. Can I pick up the documents on Monday afternoon? I asked. I will personally hand over the documents to Kells and inform her of the situation before officially handing them over on Tuesday, Bill agreed, nodding in understanding. Then he instructed his assistant to prepare the server for Tuesday. Also, I would like Jason and his assistants to be served on Tuesday afternoon. I think we should also contact Shannon, as she will need information soon. Bill, please share the file with Shannon's lawyer on Monday afternoon, I asked. If he doesn't interfere with my conversation with Kelsey on Monday night, then everything should be fine by Wednesday. Matt, have you thought about where Kelsey is staying on Monday night? Bill asked. Is there any problem with her staying in the house for a few days? Not until you get a restraining order and she agrees to it. I wouldn't want to sleep with her, I replied. From a legal point of view, I think it's not a problem, but it might confuse you, he said. I would worry about how a more unethical lawyer might use this information, Bill remarked. Okay, I'll give her a week to find a place. I don't see anything wrong with that, I replied. Oh, you mean sleeping in the same bed? But according to our legal documents, I'm temporarily in charge of the house and Kate, right? I asked. Yes, until her lawyer files a motion and cancels it all, or until we come to a mutual agreement, Bill replied. I meant that we really sleep in the same bed, I said. It can create a strange vibration when applied, Bill remarked. But don't worry, now we definitely won't sleep together. He turned to Larry and asked, Hey, what have you learned about Shannon's health? Larry replied, she has been struggling with depression and bipolar disorder for many years. The medications she was taking destroyed her sex drive, so Mr. Wonderful started looking for another place for himself. Bill jokingly added, I don't think we want to know how you found out about this. Larry just smiled and shook his head and Bill pretended to be shocked. Does this have something to do with us? I asked. Not at the moment, they replied. This may become important later especially during the custody discussion when we will decide who will live with him and when. We should consider including this condition in the final draft so that Caitlin is never alone with him. While they were talking, Bill was diligently taking notes on his iPad. After chatting for a few more minutes, we gradually completed our strategy session and returned to our daily chores. I didn't feel well all weekend as I couldn't get rid of the load of tasks that I had to complete on Monday. Despite my mood, Kelsey didn't seem to notice anything, which I hadn't really expected. To make my life easier, I called my aunt on Sunday and arranged for her to pick Caitlin up from school on Monday and leave her overnight. It would give me the opportunity to have a serious conversation with Kelsey about some important family matters. Fortunately, my aunt lived on a farm outside the city, and Caitlin really enjoyed playing with their dogs and feeding the animals. Besides, She's taking Caitlin to school on Tuesday morning. I decided that we would tell Caitlin the news on Tuesday evening. I informed Caitlin that she was going to her aunt's, and she looked worried, but at the same time a little puzzled why she had to wait until Tuesday. I explained that mom and dad needed to be alone to discuss everything. She reluctantly agreed. I slept in the spare room that night, and again Kelsey didn't say anything about it. She seemed relieved when she saw that I had gone to sleep in the spare room. On Sunday evening, I lay and thought about the upcoming conversation with Caitlin. After reviewing the checklist and confirming my plan, I finally fell asleep. The next morning I spoke with the vice president of production, informing him of the need for a week's rest. I also contacted my assistant and senior production manager to make sure they were fully informed of all the necessary details during my absence. Later that day, I unexpectedly walked into Bill's office and found Larry there. I noticed a stack of documents on the table, 
and the bustle in the office indicated that everyone was working hard. Bill came up to me, holding a stack of papers in his hands. Matt, we filed documents with the court this morning and here are Kelsey's documents at your request. We have scheduled the official filing of documents at your house for 9 a.m. on Tuesday, do you mind? I accepted the envelopes and replied, yes, it suits me. I plan to convince her to take the rest of the week off. I'll let you know if there are any changes. Great, it's okay, Bill said, taking a moment to collect his thoughts. Larry found Shannon's lawyer, who turned out to be very impressive. Bill sent him all their documents, and the lawyer seemed ready to accuse him of adultery and get a bigger share of their property than 50. 50. He assured Bill that he would not take any action until the next morning. So, everything looked promising. Based on recent calls and emails, Kelsey is scheduled to meet with her lawyer next week. Larry asked cautiously, Matt, please let me know if you need any additional help, okay? This prompted another sharp look from Bill, indicating his concern about our situation. I think it's okay, I assured him, hoping to avoid further complications. It looks like Kelsey and Jason will take care of everything. After leaving Bill's office, I quickly texted Kelsey. Will you come home at a reasonable time today? Around 5.30 p.m. Why are you asking? Is everything okay? She asked. It's nothing special. I just got a little distracted over the weekend and I want to catch up tonight. I have arranged with Aunt Alex that she will pick up Kate tonight and stay with her overnight, I said. I decided to cook a homemade dinner. Do you have any preferences? I asked. That's very nice of you. Of course, I'll be home on time, she replied. Dinner will be served at 5.30 p.m., I said. I couldn't help feeling guilty for putting her in this situation, but lately it seems to have become a habit. I hoped that she believed that I was just very sweet and affectionate. Kelsey arrived home at 5.15 p.m. and went to change while I prepared the table and laid out the food. I poured each of us a glass of wine and had already sat down at the table when she joined me. While she took leisurely sips, we shared the dishes and had a light conversation. She seemed completely unaware of what was waiting for us. After finishing the meal, we both put our favorite dishes on plates. Did you want to plan something? What is it? She asked, giving me a sidelong glance. No, I thought that after our conversation you would want to take a week off, I replied in a monotone voice, trying not to show emotion. Why should I do this? What's the matter? What is it? She asked. I know, Kelsey, I began, putting the envelope on the table in front of her. She looked at him, then at me, taking a sip of wine. I know about your relationship with Jason, and that you are going to file for divorce, I said. After taking a sip of wine, she coughed slightly and stared at me blankly. I could see the wheels turning in her head, trying to piece together how I found out about this and what she should do in this situation. Finally, she realized what was going on and asked, What kind of scam is this? I told her about the meeting with the lawyer scheduled for next week and that Jason had already filed for divorce from Shannon. I know about your feelings for him and that you plan to leave me and take Kate with you. I opened the envelope and handed her the photos. When she looked through them, her eyes widened and she lowered her glass. I watched as tears welled up in her eyes and she began to hiccup, a sign of her overwhelming emotions. I'm so sorry, Matthew. I never wanted this to happen, she whispered, her voice breaking. She fell silent, staring at the table in front of her. I understand, Kelsey. I've known about your plans for a long time. I've had time to think about it, I reassured her. I am deeply disappointed by your actions, and it causes me great pain. I took a break to pull myself together and suppress my growing anger. All I have to do is find out if I did something that pushed you to Jason, I asked. Her response was a quick denial, followed by a guilty and ashamed retreat to the table. She claimed that I didn't do anything like that. You didn't do anything to push me away. You were a wonderful husband and father. I just fell in love with him myself. She confessed, making me feel both disappointed and relieved. I guess there's nothing I can do if she just stopped loving me and chose Jason over me. 
he managed to win her over and replace me in her heart. Now I was powerless to stop it. Our marriage has come to an end, and only the formalities remain. I wrote down the terms of our divorce, and gave them to her. Here is the agreement that I propose. I've already completed all the necessary paperwork, so you don't have to worry about it. If you agree with my proposal, the main points will be as follows. The prenuptial agreement remains in force, so there is no need to discuss my trust. I propose to sell all the common property and divide the proceeds equally, including the house. Because I initiated the application process first. I'm asking for full custody of Caitlin and minimal alimony, I added. I am ready to take a flexible approach to organizing visits. I will continue to provide Caitlin with insurance, but you will have to get your own insurance. You can keep your own funds, investments received in marriage, and inheritance from your mother. I have no intention of taking what is rightfully yours. All the investments that we have made together will be divided equally. Caitlin and I will stay in the house until it is sold, I replied. I'm also contributing $200,000 from my trust to help you settle in. I advise you to think about drawing up a prenuptial agreement to secure your property in case you and Jason carry out your plans. The main thing for me is that you don't suffer any losses. I want you to be independent and self-sufficient, and I don't need any financial support from you, I finished. While she was processing the information she received, I paused to observe her reaction. I think I should take Caitlin with me. She will need a mother when she grows up, she said firmly. I completely agree with you, but this situation can be resolved remotely, through visits and phone calls. To be honest, I don't trust Jason with our daughter. I know that he intends to manipulate her against me with gifts and his feigned politeness, since he cannot have a child of his own. It looks like he wants mine. I have already made concessions by allowing him to have my wife, but I will not allow him to have my daughter. If necessary, I am ready to discuss the issue of custody, I added. I made this offer as a gesture of goodwill when I noticed how red her face was during a stormy conversation about Kate and Jason. He will never hurt her, and this decision ultimately depends on me. Getting rid of her mother's influence is not a positive step in this process, she replied threateningly. No matter what, she will stay with me until we come up with another plan. You can stay in the master bedroom for a few nights or even a week until everything is sorted out, I suggested. My love for you remains unshakable despite the difficulties we face. I believed that we were one team ready to fight the world together. But your actions cause me great pain and confusion. I will do my best to handle the situation with mercy and compassion, but my world is crumbling around me. I don't want to hurt you the way you hurt me. Please understand that if you escalate the situation or involve others in it, I will not hesitate to take self-defense measures. Remember that I have resources at my disposal that surpass anything you or Jason possess, I replied calmly. My behavior had changed, and now she could hear the rage in my voice. I'm capable of being tough when I'm under pressure. She's seen this side of me in the past. So let's calmly sort out this situation, and let the lawyers deal with the rest. It is very important for me to remain polite and respectful to you whenever we communicate. It's important for our daughter Caitlin to see how we get along. I am determined that we both play an active role in her life. I reported this hoping to avoid a long and bitter argument. I have free time until the end of the week, and according to the requirements of the law, you must be officially served, which should happen at our house at 9 a.m. I don't want you to feel uncomfortable at work, so maybe you should take a few days off too. I understand that it will be difficult for both of us to be at home at this time, but I think it would be better to meet with Caitlin tomorrow evening or leave her at home on Wednesday to discuss the situation. I suggested. Kelsey had already stopped eating and didn't seem to be feeling well. I think she finally realized the seriousness of her action. She can only blame herself for the consequences. I was happy and didn't pay attention until she broke everything. She looked at me with a puzzled expression and confessed, You obviously outsmarted us. Somehow you managed to plan everything in advance. She promised that she would get in touch with work quickly and stay at home until Wednesday. 
How about leaving Caitlin at her aunt's until tomorrow and bringing her back Wednesday morning so we can have a proper conversation? I asked. Kelsey seemed to agree with this plan, giving me a slight nod as she sorted through the paperwork. I wished her good night, feeling that she needed time to think about the news. She retreated into the bedroom, closing the door behind her. Since I had already moved most of my daily clothes and necessities to the spare room, there shouldn't have been any more problems. I contacted my aunt and told her about the family business we were working on, and she kindly agreed to leave Caitlin for an extra night and bring her back on Wednesday morning. I also talked to Caitlin and informed her that she would not go to school the next day. She was a little puzzled, but she didn't object. I assured her that my mother and I would clarify everything on Wednesday. While I was tidying up and getting ready for bed, I heard Kelsey talking to herself behind the closed door, as if she was having a phone conversation. Later, I heard quiet sobs. She was grieving that our marriage was over. The next morning, I heard Kelsey get ready for work early and come downstairs dressed casually. At 9 o'clock sharp, she opened the door to receive her package, except for the photos and transcripts she had been looking through in her room the night before. Right after that, she hurriedly grabbed her keys and purse and hurried out the door. She didn't specify where she was going, but I got the impression that she was meeting with Jason, her lawyer, or someone else who might be on her side. Later that day, Bill called to say that Jason and their company had received our claims. To my surprise, Jason also received a counterclaim from Shannon. Bill stressed the importance of remaining vigilant and careful, as there were rumors about Jason's threats against me. I never thought Jason could be so stupid, considering he always had everything he wanted. But just in case, I took my point .45 caliber pistol out of the gun safe, made sure it was loaded, cocked and locked, and put it on a chair, sitting down to watch TV. A few hours later, while I was standing at the sink, a black BMW pulled up to my house and an angry Jason got out of it with a baseball bat. Realizing the gravity of the situation, I quickly returned to the chair where my mobile phone was waiting for me. Feeling safe behind the locked door, I quickly dialed 911 and reported that my wife's boyfriend was outside with a baseball bat. Several cars were sent to my address. When I heard another car pull up to the house and then there were screams and screams, I realized that it was Kelsey. Suddenly there was a loud squeal in the house. My heart started pounding when the front door shattered and Jason stormed into the house in a rage. You bastard! You got me fired! You ruined my divorce! He growled, foaming at the mouth. I put my right hand on the butt of the gun. The feeling of it calmed me down. Jason was swinging the bat and I heard Kelsey screaming, begging him to come back. I took your wife and now I'm going to end you and take your daughter. I let him walk another five pounds before pulling out a gun. It was clear from the narrowed eyes that his decisions were questionable. He held the bat high, but its effectiveness at a distance of 25 feet was questionable. The sound of the shot from the chamber was loud and sharp. I was always taught to hit the target three times, so I quickly fired two shots in a row. When Jason slowed down, his next step seemed hesitant to me, as a result of which he stumbled and fell just as the third bullet flew out of the barrel. I noticed a sudden movement at the door, but I was too engrossed in what I was doing to pay attention to it. Suddenly, a bullet flew past and bit into the broken front door, narrowly missing Kelsey. Jason collapsed to the ground, first on his knees and then face forward. A cacophony of screams and the deafening sound of a gunshot filled my ears, making me realize how loud it was in such a cramped room. Sirens wailed in the distance, followed by frantic screams from the police. Unaware of the gravity of the situation, they put Kelsey on her stomach and handcuffed her in front of an open door. Her screams and screams rang out continuously. The unfolding events stunned me, and finally my attention was attracted by the gun pointed at my face and the officer's urgent commands to stop and drop the weapon. When I came to my senses, I obeyed his order and handed over the gun. The next two weeks were a whirlwind of chaos and stress. 
Jason was injured by a policeman at the scene of the crime. Later, I learned from police reports and witness statements that he had simultaneously received my lawsuit and updated divorce papers from his wife. It didn't take him long to realize that the incriminating photos had been obtained from me. Kelsey stood next to him while he opened the envelope he received from his wife and confirmed that she also had a set of these photos. Soon after, they were both summoned to the vice president's office, where they confessed their affair. Unaware of the possible consequences, the managers decided to fire the managing director for communicating with a subordinate, knowing that my application would not be considered. This decision made me the object of Jason's anger, who believed that I had offended him by speaking out against his actions. Inflamed with anger, he took a souvenir bat from his office and headed to my house, wanting revenge for what he perceived as betrayal. Kelsey spotted him from the window of the conference room on the second floor and quickly guessed where he was going. Hurrying to intercept him in the driveway, she tried to defuse the situation before he could harm me. None of them knew that I had been warned of their imminent appearance and was ready to confront them. Trying to prevent Jason from entering the house, Kelsey got a black eye from his outburst of rage. Fortunately, she escaped further injury, but the ordeal haunted her for several more months in the form of recurring nightmares. I've only spoken to her a couple of times amid the chaos of police interrogations, court hearings, and courtroom visits. We never entered into a deep conversation about the events that took place in our house. Kelsey was just a shadow of her old self. The loss of her husband and daughter in less than a day had a big impact on her. She has never been able to recover from this tragedy. Despite the fact that they kept in touch with her during the divorce process, after it was completed, she seemed to gradually distance herself. Kelsey did not resist and did not hire a lawyer to challenge the divorce. As a result, I had no difficulty getting custody of Caitlin. To my amazement, she constantly refused to fulfill her financial obligations. Bill held on to her share for a while but eventually returned it to me a year later. She never returned to our house but lived with her family until she disappeared. During the attack on me, Dimason was severely injured during detention and spent a long time in the hospital, and after that he completely changed. He became very fixated on his failure and led a reclusive lifestyle. Despite several supervised visits to Caitlin, they were often uncomfortable or unproductive. I made sure that Caitlin was always ready for these visits, regardless of whether we had heard of Kelsey or not. Unfortunately, Kelsey only appeared four times. I heard that Kelsey was addicted to painkillers and other prescription drugs that were supposed to help her find peace and stability. By the time she disappeared, she had lost her job, friends, and all her money. Neither Caitlin nor I nor anyone else who knew her had the opportunity to contact her, and she never contacted us. Her disappearance left us without a wife and mother. As a result, we had to sell the house without knowing what had become of her. My daughter and I have been making efforts to rebuild our lives after a traumatic event. We sought help from psychologists to cope with the pain. I went to counseling for six months, but in the end I had to put the pain on the back burner and focus on raising my daughter and moving forward. Caitlin, on the other hand, spent several years with a counselor trying to come to terms with the divorce and Kelsey's disappearance. She had to solve a lot of psychological problems. It took me three years to finally realize that I was ready to start dating again. A few months after this realization, I met an amazing woman named Jo. She treated our past with incredible understanding and respect. Our relationship developed slowly, much more slowly than either of us would have liked. But eventually, we took the next step and entered into a physical relationship. After about 16 months, we decided to get married. Joe and I raised Caitlin like our own daughter, but we never felt the need to expand the family. Our lives became more stable and complete as we moved forward together. Over time, our biggest problems became related to the turning points in Caitlin's life, her graduation from high school and college. Despite the fact that Larry was repeatedly hired in an attempt to find Kelsey, every lead eventually led to a dead end. 
Kelsey was believed to have met a tragic end in isolation and despair. It was a difficult ordeal, but we persevered and eventually found a way out. I was grateful for the opportunity to develop a strategy and take decisive action. This story began with the fact that on Friday after work, I ran into my former high school classmate Tom Homer in a liquor store. It's been many years since we last saw each other, and since the store was crowded with customers, we had plenty of time to catch up. To our surprise, we discovered that Tom's wife Cecilia works in the same office where my wife and I have been working for the last six months. Tom mentioned that he hadn't seen me at our wife's Christmas party and asked if I would come to the farewell party of the old owner of their company. I expressed a desire to go, but mentioned that I had not received an invitation. Tom's expression was surprised when he assured me, Of course you're invited and all the spouses are invited too. And why not? I will definitely confirm this. See you there, old man. The reason for the upcoming big corporate party, held just two and a half months after Christmas, was that the old owners had recently sold their shares to a nationwide investment company. They wanted to express their appreciation to all their colleagues before the new owners officially take office on March 1st. I couldn't help but remember the Christmas party. It was my first after starting work at a new place. She said she was sorry, but I wasn't invited to the party. She bought a new, provocative dress for the event and looked stunning when she left. But she returned home at four in the morning, drunk and disheveled. We argued, but she insisted that she had been to a party and then had a drink at a friend's place for the night. She cried and swore that she had nothing with any of the men, but I had serious doubts about her story. I could only wonder what I could do without any evidence. When I returned home after shopping, I wasted no time in sharing the news that I had run into my old friend Tom Homer at the liquor store. He mentioned that his wife works for the same company as her, and she seemed worried when she asked, What's her name? I replied, Cecilia Homer, do you know her? She shook her head. No, I don't know. No, I said. But he mentioned that all the spouses are invited to your Christmas party. I couldn't help but wonder who pretended to be your spouse at that party. And where did you spend that night? I have repeatedly mentioned that in my opinion the spouses were not included in the invitation. I was not familiar with this event. So you're saying that you're the only smart employee in this company who can understand the meaning of a simple invitation? Burning with anger, she vowed to find out who had offended her at the party and make him regret his act. Tears streamed down her face as she sobbed. I explained many times that there were at least 12, maybe 15 people in someone's house. It was just a few drinks and light dancing. You don't need to get upset or jealous. There were too many inconsistencies in her story, but I couldn't move on without proof. So I asked her if I was invited to the upcoming corporate party. Again, I noticed a strange expression on her face because she hadn't told me anything about the party. But now she knew that I knew about the couple's invitation and replied that she had booked tickets to the party for both of us, but forgot to tell me. I had serious doubts about her honesty. Needless to say, our marriage was at a very remote distance. The thought of being intimate with her seemed like a waste of time to me. The situation worsened the following Friday afternoon, when I took a few hours off from work on business. She usually left work at 1 o'clock on Fridays, so we were both at home when the phone rang. I answered the phone and heard dance music coming from the car in the background, but the caller hung up without saying anything. Na asked me who it was and I told her. Your lover hung up when he heard that I was answering the phone. She was silent for a moment, and then burst into screams, accusing me of being weird and asking questions about what I really think of her. After her violent reaction, I wondered if I was wrong about something. Eventually she calmed down and admitted that my joke was more of a jealous humiliation than a harmless joke. She apologized for losing her temper, blaming it on a hard day at work. Although this is not an excuse, I hope it helps explain why I was in a bad mood. Enid decided to wear a less provocative dress than the last time at the party, and when we arrived, she looked far from cheerful. 
The event was held in one of the best hotels in the city, and dinner was served at round tables, rather than at the usual long ones. We were sitting with four other couples, and Enid seemed to know all the other women. I couldn't shake the feeling that she perceived my presence as an annoyance, ruining her plans for a fun evening. After dinner, while we were enjoying coffee and a glass of cognac, Enid's boss came up to our table to start a casual conversation. When he saw me sitting next to Enid, he remarked, You must be Enid's husband. We missed you at the Christmas party. It's a pity that you couldn't come. I replied, Actually, I wasn't invited to this party. At least that's what Andy told me. His gaze shifted to Andy and he asked, All the spouses were invited. How did you miss it? I explained, She arrived home very late and in a pretty serious condition, so I'm sure she preferred someone from the office to replace me. Some of the other couples couldn't help but laugh when she turned red like a tomato. Her boss, clearly feeling uncomfortable, said, I don't know anything about it. When he left, I answered, You should know, there are three or four of them in all offices. I started crying, and it seemed the other couples were embarrassed too, as they quickly went to the toilet. I followed their example and ended up chatting with another spouse who was sitting at our table. He informed me that at the Christmas party, he and my wife were sitting quite close to each other. Throughout the evening, she spent a lot of time with one of her colleagues, and he remembered my wife because she mentioned her noble and old-fashioned surname. It came as a shock to me because I never expected something like this to happen to me. But I knew that before me, many unsuspecting men had learned the bitter truth about their cheating wives in this way. The news hit me like a punch in the stomach. I've noticed that the spark between my wife and me has been fading lately, but I attributed it to the usual ups and downs that all marriages go through. I was sure that everything would get better soon. But my fears were heightened when one of her co-workers informed me that she had left the party and was not answering her phone. When the babysitter didn't answer my calls either, I realized something was wrong and hurried home, paying the babysitter on the way. I spent some time at the bar, glad that no one talked about it. When I got home, I found her sleeping in our bed. The next day was the worst day of our 11 years of marriage. I screamed and screamed, demanding to know where she was at the Christmas party. On Monday, she went to work as usual, grateful that no one had mentioned this shameful incident. Even her boss seemed to think it was a personal matter. But the gossip among her colleagues was completely different. To my surprise, on Friday evening, she began to make love, showing a new enthusiasm and energy that satisfied both of us. It was a stark contrast to her usual behavior. I couldn't help but wonder if her sudden interest in intimacy was related to my recent rude behavior and accusations of infidelity. I found that I couldn't fall asleep right after our passionate lovemaking. My head was full of thoughts in particular that he liked it better when I behaved like a caveman and not like the kind good guy I used to be. The next eight days passed without any significant events, and I began to hope that our marriage was improving. But one morning everything changed in an instant, when I noticed that my wife was dressed more elegantly than usual, and her hair was styled differently. This small change indicated that something was about to change dramatically in our relationship. At breakfast, she mentioned that she had forgotten to tell me about the possibility of working overtime the day before because her boss had brought it up. I saw no reason to hold back my thoughts, so I jokingly asked why she needed to dress especially attractively for overtime work. I suggested that she just tell me the truth if she plans to meet her lover instead. My comment caught her off guard, as evidenced by the shock on her face before she started screaming. She accused me of being paranoid and urged me to seek help in connection with my behavior. It's time to end this marriage so that you can be openly with your lover. I can no longer be married to a cheating spouse. Tears flowed freely, and even our children joined them crying loudly. I doubted my actions and wondered what I had done to my family. I started the fight without having any evidence of infidelity, just an intuitive feeling after a sleepless night. After crying for a while, she asked if I really wanted a divorce. 
I realized that this was the only solution if she continued to betray our marriage. It was better for us to break up and move on. I am tired of being mistreated and have reached a breaking point. As I hurried back to our bedroom, I felt guilty for having falsely accused her. I should have followed the typical evidence-gathering procedure before accusing her. If I had solid evidence, then I could meet her face to face. Returning to the kitchen a few minutes later, she appeared in her usual weekday outfit. She was silent, leaving me at a loss. It dawned on me that only a miracle could save our marriage. If she's innocent, she probably won't be able to bear the humiliation I put her through recently. But if she is guilty of infidelity, then our relationship will end as soon as I find evidence of her infidelity. When she returned home in the evening, she shared an amazing story with me. She informed her boss that I had declined her request to work overtime, and he believed her because he knew me from a previous party. Although I should have contacted her boss to clear up the misunderstanding, I did not. But I was pleasantly surprised when the new owners of the company I worked for came to the rescue. Their OT department conducted a secret investigation into the use of computers in the office and found that employees spend an average of 52 minutes a day on personal tasks. The most egregious offender was online for 16 hours during the week when the investigation was underway. The following Monday, the entire staff of her office was called to a meeting where they were introduced to the new rules. According to these rules, any personal use of the internet is now prohibited. As a result of increased efficiency and stricter rules, four newly hired employees were fired. But she managed to keep her job, even though she now had to use a shared computer at home for all her email correspondence. Although the children had their own computers, they were not provided with internet access. I have always been interested in computer programs, and I had a feeling that soon we would be playing in my backyard. I was ready for this, and set up the computer using a mirror program to save copies of all her actions. Another program allowed you to restore everything that it deleted. A few days later, she created a new free happy underscore last email account on our computer, in addition to her old Hotmail address, which she used for innocent conversations with old friends who had separated. The new account received only a few messages, mostly from happy underscore lad and the usual junk mail. The messages she exchanged in the first week were harmless, just informing happy underscore lad about her new mailbox and that she could go online again. Even his first response, which she quickly deleted, was vague, expressing happiness that his darling was back online. It was becoming clear to me that she was involved in something, and I hoped that I could gather valuable information about it. Naturally, they could rely on cell phones to communicate, especially since at home she was limited in using a computer. She knew I was tech-savvy, but I was sure she preferred email for longer messages. I have decided that she will not receive half of our property if she causes our divorce due to infidelity. I worked hard to provide for my family, and I wasn't going to let some romantic crush miss it. Therefore, I started implementing the financial plan I had developed to protect my hard-earned money. As the sole owner of our house, I was able to get a significant loan for investments without involving anyone else as a co-borrower. To my surprise, the bank approved my request for the entire amount I requested. The next day, I informed my wife that I needed to go to Italy to conduct final negotiations on the purchase of a new car for my work. Since I had made similar trips in the past, she did not object or ask questions. The next day, I visited a local travel agency and purchased a cheap flight to Malaga, Spain, and also booked a hotel room in Gibraltar, a small British territory. Gibraltar, known as the rock controlling traffic between the Atlantic Ocean and the Mediterranean Sea, is known as one of the most notorious money laundering centers in Europe. Despite the fact that I booked tickets through a travel agency for a trip from Gibraltar to London and back home, I did not report my three-day absence to work. Going on a trip, I took a local bus from Malaga to the Spanish border town of La Linea, and then got to Gibraltar. But contrary to my established reputation, I was not involved in money laundering during my visit. Instead, I spent time sightseeing in Gibraltar and its surroundings. 
The next morning, I boarded the first flight to London, and then went home. Throughout the trip, I tried to use my personal MasterCard for most purchases, knowing that it would leave a noticeable mark if someone tried to track my movements. With limited resources at my disposal, I decided to dig into our computer to find at least some clues. Unfortunately, nothing special was found. Only one message from Happy Lad expressing his desire to get her company, which she left unanswered. While she was taking a shower, I took the opportunity to check her phone, but found that all messages had been deleted as usual. But just when I was about to give up hope, I came across important information in his next letter. It said, Hi, sweetheart. I'm sorry I was busy with important meetings. I really missed you in those days when your forgetful husband was in Italy. I can't wait until next Wednesday to spend the whole day together. The only commitment that we have on the agenda is a visit to the dentist from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. The rest of the day is open for you and me to enjoy it together. Please take a day off, at least from 11 a.m., and spend it with me. Signed, Frederick. I finally found out his name and profession, which gave me a glimmer of hope that she would respond to his letter, and she replied, Dear Frederick, I will gladly take the day off after 11 a.m. How about a romantic dinner at your place so that I won't be seen together in the city while I'm free from work? I'm sure Larry still has suspicions, so our time out was the right decision to keep our love a secret, but I think it would be useful to break our time out at least once. I often think about you and look forward to the day ahead when we will be together. Love, Anne. I was happy to find an apartment that could be rented and paid for a year in advance in case of problems during the divorce. Trying to find a salesman named Frederick in our city turned out to be a difficult task, since it was a common name and profession. I suspected that he worked for the same company as her. I had the date and time so if I didn't find any more leads, I had a small chance to follow her to his place. Nowadays, many people use cell phones to communicate including her lover Frederick, since I couldn't find any more information on our computer. The day before, I had prepared everything for what I expected to be a fantastic day. Funds were debited from my personal and joint bank accounts, which mysteriously disappeared from sight. I rented a van with tinted windows for our outing. But to my amazement, she seemed completely oblivious to the impending excitement. She was dressed casually, effortlessly, she didn't even seem to know about the plans I had prepared for us. Part of me began to wonder if she had decided to cancel our date altogether. I couldn't hide my concern, and a worried expression appeared on her face. Are you okay? You don't look well. I hardly answered. I'm fine. I just had a little problem today that needs to be solved, but I have everything under control. Despite my assurances, I noticed that she was worried. You look so pale she remarked. Don't worry, I'm fine. Trying to change the subject, I suggested, it would be nice to have lunch together today to discuss some important issues. It was obvious from her hesitant response that she felt uncomfortable. I'm grateful for the invitation, but unfortunately, I have an important lunch meeting at work today. But I can come tomorrow. I kept eye contact with her and added, I understand how important it is to resolve urgent matters first. Her expression changed, and she seemed to have reconsidered her plans for the day. Despite my calmness, I was far from okay, because the future of our family depended on her actions in the coming hours. I am grateful for the invitation, but unfortunately, I have an important meeting at work today. I was worried that our family breakfast might be the last, and the lunch tradition might be cancelled forever. My wife left for work taking Elliot to kindergarten with her. Angelica went to school, leaving me alone at home. I decided to take a day off from work again. By 10.30 a.m., I parked the van at her workplace, positioning it so that I could clearly see her car and the entrance for employees. Thanks to the tinted windows, I was able to get into the back seat unnoticed and no one noticed, at lunch. But I can come tomorrow. I kept eye contact with her and added, I understand how important it is to resolve urgent matters first. Her expression changed, and she seemed to have reconsidered her plans for the day. 
Despite my calmness, I was far from okay, because the future of our family depended on her actions in the coming hours. At 11.05 a.m., she hurried to the parking lot, got into her car and drove to a residential area on the outskirts of the city. I followed her and saw her park at one of the entrances before going inside. Inside I got acquainted with the information board and saw that a certain Frederica Albinson lives on the second floor. After waiting five minutes, I called her on her cell phone. When she saw my name on the caller ID, she answered and asked, What's the matter, Larry? I replied, You, my love, are my biggest problem. She replied incredulously, Me? Are you crazy? No, my dear, but I found out that your lover is at home now and you should be there with him. I'm on my way to meet him. Get dressed and leave him before I come. She looked worried but insisted, What are you talking about? I'm at work. If you're lying, you'll regret it. I hung up the phone and found myself in front of Frederick's door with a sledgehammer and a black garbage bag. As expected, a man in his thirties opened the door a minute later. I hit him, which made him stumble back into the apartment. To his mistress, who was standing behind him, I shouted, Get out of here now! Before she could react, I pushed her out of the apartment and locked the door. Left alone with Frederick, I tirelessly attacked him with both fists until he fell to the floor. In another situation, this young, fit man would most likely have defeated me. But caught off guard and overcome with anger over a failed marriage, I easily overcame him. When he was down and lying on the ground, I ruthlessly destroyed everything of value in his modest studio apartment with a sledgehammer. Realizing that this was not his real place of residence, I took Frederick's mobile phone and important documents from his briefcase, including his home address and personal information. I found her still outside the door, ringing the bell and screaming, Don't touch him! Don't touch him! I opened the door, dragged her into the apartment and said bluntly, He's yours now. Do what you want with him, I don't care about you at all. She was shocked to see the state I left Frederick and his apartment in. Tears filled her eyes and she begged, let me explain. Please listen to me, Larry. I silenced her by sharply ordering her to be quiet. I went to the van, where I found Frederick's documents, from which it turned out that he works as a salesman in the same company as me, but lives with his family near the capital. This explained why he had a small apartment in our city. Reading the papers, I couldn't help but feel a surge of anger towards Frederick for ruining my marriage. Remembering the saying, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, I realized that I had to act. The first thing I did was call her parents and offered them to look after our children after school, as I had to stay late at work and solve personal problems. Fortunately, they agreed to help. After turning off my mobile phone, I went on a two-day trip in a rented van. When I returned to my hometown two days later, I turned on my phone and found that numerous messages were waiting for me. In response, I wrote her a message informing her that I had filed for divorce, confirming that this was my final decision regarding our marriage. After that, I spent the rest of the day moving my stuff from our house to my new apartment. I left copies of the divorce papers on the kitchen table, from which it became clear that Frederick's affair had been going on for several months. If it had been a one-time mistake at the Christmas party, there might have been a chance for forgiveness. But my confrontation during the last family breakfast did not keep her from meeting him, which led to a violent quarrel. The next day, I went to work as usual, but was stunned when my boss didn't call me. Instead, the police called me about Frederick. Due to the tight schedule, we made an appointment three weeks later. During lunch, I contacted Anne's mother, who informed me that the children would stay with her for a few days, and that Anne had not spoken out against the divorce. Three days later, Anne called me, furious that our finances had been reduced to zero. She angrily threatened to sue me, and accused me of destroying Frederick's house. I tried to explain that money can be replaced, but our lost love and ruined family cannot. Not satisfied with my answer, she continued to scold me. Three weeks later, my lawyer and I met with the police. The conversation was cordial, 
and my lawyer did not have any questions about everything that was discussed. But the police accused me of severely beating Frederick, preventing him from working for two weeks and causing significant damage to his property. I denied all the charges, except that I used self-defense when my wife's furious lover attacked me during their date. The policeman seemed to have done his duty by not incriminating me, most likely due to a lack of sympathy for my wife's infidelity. I wasn't too worried, because even if I had been found guilty and ordered to pay Frederick compensation, he wouldn't actually have received any money. It would just be a legal document giving him the right to demand payment from me. If I don't have the money, then it will be his problem. I was shocked when she called me out of the blue and offered to meet at a restaurant to discuss our children. To my surprise, the meeting went smoothly, and we managed to have a polite conversation. It was during this meeting that she confessed that she had an affair with Frederick, which began shortly after she got a new job. She was helping Frederick in the sales department, and tension immediately arose between them. Lunch at his apartment quickly turned into something more intimate. They had quick meetings from time to time, but the opportunities were limited as Frederick rarely visited the main office. When Frederick's wife couldn't attend the Christmas party, he saw it as a chance to spend the whole night together. Despite initial doubts, she agreed, but later regretted that it was the biggest mistake of her life. She admitted that she had an affair with Frederick, but insisted that her love for her family, including me, had never waned. Even when I accused her of infidelity, she remained steadfast in her love for me. She told me that they planned to end the affair on the same day that I ran into Frederick. She has already prepared a plan to make amends when she becomes a faithful wife again. She explained that she and Frederick decided to live together after his wife left him, but she would end the relationship if I gave her another chance. Unfortunately, the pain was too much for me, and I declined her offer. In the end, we agreed that she would have primary custody of the children, but they could see me whenever they wanted. She hesitated before finally plucking up the courage to ask me about the money. Tears welled up in her eyes when I confessed that I had lost everything because of a stupid investment, and this was a consequence of her decision to leave me. I made it clear to her that the loss of a family is a much greater price than any money. Despite her promises to reunite the family, I told her that I would rather have a cheating ex-wife than take her back. Her expression turned sour at my answer. Before we broke up, I warned her against hiring a lawyer to find the lost money, as it would be expensive and most likely to no avail. The next Monday morning at work, I immediately noticed that something was wrong with my secretary Sarah. She was wearing sunglasses, but when she took them off, I saw that she had a bruise on her left eye, and her right eye was red, which hinted at the tears shed over the weekend. Despite the fact that she was hesitant to talk about herself at first, she eventually admitted, Now I'm a single mother. I was shocked to learn that Sarah and Daniel had broken up, as I had always considered them the perfect couple. When I asked for details, she explained that the fact that her husband hit her once could be forgiven as a mistake, but the fact that he hit her a second time indicates that this is no longer tolerable. She decided to divorce Daniel after he hit her a second time. I used to think he was a good guy and believed that you were the perfect couple. I can't understand why he suddenly became so unstable. The reason for his behavior is jealousy. The first time he showed aggression was when I danced a passionate tango with a charming man at a wedding. He was a skilled dancer, but it was just a harmless dance that angered Daniel to the point where he hit me. None of the other men at the wedding objected to their partners dancing with this handsome man. In the end I forgave Daniel but I made it clear that if it happened again, it would be the last time. He promised that it would never happen again. He did it, and now we're getting divorced. Why did he hit you this time? Because it's my fault. And now we're breaking up. I was completely confused and asked her how could I be to blame for her cheating on that jerk Frederick. I couldn't figure out what was going on. She did it because you and I were having an affair. I was shocked and shouted, What? A novel? How could you not tell me when and where this allegedly happened? 
How can I be a part of the novel and not even know about it? You're not the only one. None of us knew about the affair, although you and I should have been the first to know about it. It was hard to believe that a good man like Daniel could become so reckless and bring his beautiful wife to divorce. I've always admired Sarah, but I've never made inappropriate attacks on her, despite my feelings for her. I wondered why he didn't trust me. I have always remained faithful despite many temptations over the years. I must admit that sometimes I feel a pang of jealousy towards David for being married to the girl of his dreams. But there is a clear distinction between innocent dreams and painful deeds. Where did he get such unfounded and false rumors, and why did he blindly believe them without seeking the truth? One of his friends heard the gossip and passed it on to him. Gossip? Why didn't he come to you and me for the truth? It's amazing how trusting he can be. This is absurd. He reacted with anger. Unbelievable. She tried to brush him off and asked further. Now that the girl of your dreams is single, how about we meet at my place? My house would be perfect. Agreed. After an hour, she hesitantly asked, Are you still ready for our date? I smiled at her encouragingly and replied, I'm not going to give up. What you have offered is a rare opportunity. She asked, Are you sure I offered you something? I shook my head and replied, No, I don't expect anything in return. But a date is a date. She nodded and agreed, Yes, a date, even if we joke about our newfound single life. We both understood that this day could change our lives in different ways. The tension was building every day, and she decided to take the day off. After finishing my work, I ran about my business and went home without waiting for her to come. But at 6 o'clock she surprised me by ringing the doorbell with a small overnight bag. Sarah said she wanted to be ready in case our date still took place. I assured her that I was serious. She had a hard day after meeting with her lawyer. I suggested that she relax while I cook dinner. After dinner, I comforted her as we sat on the couch and discussed our failed marriages. She kept asking if I would consider reconciliation, but I made it clear every time that this was not an option. We went to bed early that night, and I made no attempt at intimacy. Surprisingly, she slept soundly and woke up the next morning feeling a little better. The following weekend, we rented a minibus and took all our four children to the zoo. To our delight, the day passed much more calmly than we expected. Realizing that we can function as a whole, Sarah and I decided to spend a romantic evening together. We left the children with their parents and enjoyed a wonderful dinner at one of the best restaurants in the city. When we returned to my apartment, the passion between us became palpable, and we wasted no time undressing and falling on the bed. Sarah didn't try to resist, and we let our desires take over completely. After a short break we made love, which further strengthened our bond. Sarah expressed her happiness to me, saying that our first intimate contact was incredibly pleasant. She described it as a genuine expression of love, both tender and intense. We both felt satisfied, especially me, as Sarah had surpassed her achievements in the previous months of living together. At that time, the lawyer found out about my trip to Gibraltar and tried to use it against me in the divorce proceedings. Despite numerous questions about the trip, I stuck to the same honest explanation every time. Despite a thorough investigation conducted by her lawyer, no evidence was found against me regarding the lost money. The divorce process ended as expected, leaving me with 50% of nothing and a significant debt to my ex-wife's lawyer. At the meeting when we discussed our children, I reminded her of my warnings about unscrupulous lawyers, which brought tears to her eyes. I was shocked by her response, realizing my own stupidity and recognizing it as the biggest mistake of my life. Does Frederick know that you regret what happened between you? He also regrets his role in this situation and suffers a lot because of it. Now that you're with the man you love, I hope you're really happy. Remember, I offered you an honest choice during our last family breakfast, and you chose to be with Frederick rather than have lunch with me. It was a decision that I deeply regret now, because I lost the man I loved, and Frederick and I will have to deal with the consequences of our actions. 
We are trying to make the most of the situation. Are you satisfied? They asked me. I replied, Yes, I'm quite happy with Sarah, although none of us wanted to get divorced. We both wanted our children to grow up in a family with both parents. Despite the circumstances, we are grateful that we have each other, and we intend to settle everything. Besides, Frederick bought my previous house at a bargain price. They even took on all the loans, which led to an increase in their monthly expenses compared to what I had at the time. Sarah's husband sold their house to her at a fair price, and with the proceeds, she bought a new house in which we now live. The police did not ask me for additional information about the damage at Frederick's house in the city. For them, this seemed like a minor problem, especially since they did not have enough employees and had difficulty coordinating actions between districts. I've heard rumors that the house belonged exclusively to Frederick's wife, who received most of the insurance payment. I was sentenced to two months in a white-collar prison and ordered to pay Frederick for the beating and damage to his apartment. I did not pay him, and I do not plan to do so. I promise to pay as soon as I have the money, but until then the authorities cannot collect the debt from me. Sarah and I left our previous jobs, and now they are handled by Sarah's consulting company, where I work part-time. I use a company car and live in her house as a lodger. It was beneficial for both of us, but Anne didn't stop looking for my missing money. One evening she invited Sarah to the pub to discuss the children. After a few drinks, she started asking Sarah about money. But Sarah could only honestly say that she didn't know about any money and didn't worry about it. Because I'm the best she's ever had in her life. Sarah and I have always had a good working relationship. We have developed strong family ties filled with laughter and intimacy. My children adore Sarah, and I liked her children. Everything was going well until I heard rumors that David was bragging about getting Sarah back. I knew that he regularly visits an expensive therapist and claims to have overcome his past problems. Despite this, I decided not to tell Sarah about it, believing that she should make her own choice. Sarah's former relatives had a hard time coming to terms with the fact that she broke up with their son. After repeated sincere attempts to reconcile with David, Sarah's friends regularly contacted her, promising extravagant gifts such as a new car and a luxury trip to South Africa if she agreed to return David. One evening, Sarah expressed her fears to a friend that she would be invited to the wedding of David's younger sister. Despite wanting to be present, she hesitated, fearing that David's parents would pressure her to make peace with him. When her friend assured her that there was no reason to object, Sarah decided to attend the wedding. Attending a romantic event like a wedding will give them a great chance to convince me to do something I doubt, so it's probably better for me not to go to this wedding. But I was very close to his sister and would like to be present if you don't mind. All I could say in response was, you're a grown woman, so if you want to go, then go. It would be great to see her on such a special day especially since I have a feeling that there are deep-seated problems in their relationship, and this wedding may be their last attempt to save them. Are you absolutely sure you have no objections? No? I see no reason to object. One possible fear is that you might get drunk and have to stay the night. Doesn't it bother you? No, why should I worry? Like I said, you can take care of yourself. I love you very much. David's hometown was about 37 miles from ours, and Sarah left early on Saturday morning, planning to return sometime on Sunday. I didn't ask for details because it was her decision. We agreed to limit ourselves to one phone conversation when she informed me that she had safely reached her destination. I wished her a good time at the wedding, and she hugged and kissed me before leaving. This Saturday was of great importance to me, and I was more worried than I told Sarah. I was well aware of the problems she might face during the trip, because she would have to face pressure from David, his family and friends. Despite my worries, I assured Sarah that she was capable of taking care of herself, and I had full faith in her abilities. I spent most of the day at work, and then went out for dinner and drinks with a few friends at the pub. But I didn't stay there long. Later, before going to bed, I watched the comedy on DVD. 
The next morning I was surprised to see Sarah returning home early. She hugged me warmly and led me into the bedroom to bring even more affection. Undressing, she lay down on the bed, pulled me to her and whispered, I love you so much. Make love to me. After a few moments, I followed her example. Later, she asked if I was surprised by the fact that she came home extremely agitated. In fact, I was pleasantly surprised by this revelation. I appreciate that you trusted me and allowed me to attend the wedding, despite possible attempts and temptations to reconcile with David. I knew about the situation, but I believed that you could handle it. And you did it. She then informed me that due to the large number of relatives staying overnight at David's parents' house, they had agreed that after the party, she and David would live in a small room with one bed. Sarah received insider information from the bride, which she foresaw, and has already booked a hotel room. She decided to leave the party when the persistent advice to reconcile with David began to bother her. After skipping Sunday dinner with David's family, she left the hotel after an early breakfast. It was obvious that Sarah and I had a strong relationship. Just last week, when we met in a cafe to discuss upcoming plans for our children, I noticed that she looked more unhappy than usual and asked if she and Frederick had any problems. She admitted that she did, and without hesitation confirmed that there were problems in their relationship. When I mentioned the rumors that Frederick was cheating on his wife, she burst into tears and admitted that she suspected that he was cheating on her too. I am happy that Sarah and I are now a couple and I absolutely trust her. Our life together is full of happiness and love, and Anne, as I noticed, is not particularly happy with her idiot lover. As the children tell us, there are frequent quarrels between them. Dan Wilkins and I went to Boston to present our company's products to potential buyers. The meeting seemed to go smoothly. It took some time before we received a final response from them. But on Friday at 8 a.m., we were informed that the meeting was canceled and postponed for at least a week. Since there was nothing to do in Boston, we decided to return home. On my return, I had household chores waiting for me. Karen's to-do list bothered me all day, so I was relieved to get home early and get down to business. Dan dropped me off at about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I changed into work clothes, took a tool, and got to work. A few years ago, we added a bedroom and a bathroom to our house so that our children would have their own space. It was not easy, especially considering that in order to save money, we chose a substrate rather than a full-fledged foundation. But I built a convenient hatch in the bathroom closet, which allowed me to access directly to the base of the floor. There was a removable panel in the wall in the backyard for easy access to the floor. To open the hatch, I had to close the cabinet doors almost completely so that they would not interfere. With everything I needed in my hands, I headed for the bedroom, which was too cramped to maneuver. I crawled to the pipes leading to the bathroom, jingling my keys as I went. It turned out that the rat poison that I left under the bathroom floor remained untouched. It reminded me of how I dealt with red squirrels a year ago. Without telling Karen, I bought a shotgun and spent the weekend underground, hoping to catch some pesky critters like a sheriff from the Wild West. It was quite a daring adventure, and I must admit I enjoyed the thrill. During an eventful weekend, Karen stayed with her sister. While practicing shooting, I hit a squirrel several times. Shell casings were flying everywhere, and I decided to put an empty Mountain Dew can in the corner to aim at it. After countless shots, I managed to hit the letter D from 10 feet away, and I felt like a real sniper. After that, the rodents were no longer caught, realizing that the shooting range was not the best place for them. Eventually, I got tired of this game, and I sealed the hole they were coming out of with cement leaving rat poison as a deterrent. When I was repairing the drain under the bathroom, I came across a stubborn blockage that no cleaner could eliminate. To solve this problem, I had to disassemble several connections before starting plumbing work. I had almost finished my work when the sound of footsteps broke my concentration. It was too early for Karen to be home, and there was no telling who else might be in my bedroom. When I was removing the drain pipe, 
Water poured over me. I hurriedly crawled back to the hatch to warn Karen not to use the water, but when I got to it, I heard a man's voice. That voice sent a chill down my spine. I got up slowly and closed the bathroom door. Karen undressed as if it were an ordinary day, ignoring Carson Herzog standing by our bed. The realization of this fact hit me like a brick blow. I had to act quickly before the trust of my faithful wife was undermined. I like spending time with you, Karen, Carson said with a grin, starting to undress. And then I realized that I was too late to prevent this betrayal. It was a familiar scene. Karen laughed as she undressed and jumped on the bed. We don't have much time, so hurry up, she warned. I need to get myself cleaned up before Tim gets home. We have an hour. That should be enough for a few rounds, Carson replied with a note of irritation in his voice. My cheeks were flushed with embarrassment, and my knees were shaking with excitement, a common reaction when I'm stressed. You always know how to push my buttons, Karen, he muttered. I felt anger rising in me. Karen just grinned and replied, While I have time to freshen up, do whatever you want with me. You know I like everything. I just don't want Tim to find out about it. He will be very disappointed. You're so stupid, Karen, Carson laughed. If you really cared about Tim, you wouldn't be here with me right now. Let's not pretend. We both know the truth. Karen's protest went unanswered as Carson continued to mock her. You're just a little selfish, Karen. And I'm no better. We both know that. So let's not pretend. Karen's face dropped and she looked away, unable to meet Carson's eyes. That's not true, Carson, she whispered, her voice full of regret. He is a devoted husband, father and breadwinner, but I want a little thrill in my life without losing him. I love him, I really do, Karen confessed. I'm not complaining, Carson replied. But your way of loving your man is a little unusual. It's okay, Carson, Karen purred. I love Tim, but I also love you. I want you both. Anger surged through me, but I forced myself to remain calm. A thought flashed through my head. Isn't that how obsessives feel before committing illegal actions? For God's sake, let's just keep going, Karen pleaded. When Carson started to approach my wife, I quietly slipped out of the room and headed for the exit panel. As I rounded the house, I noticed Carson's SUV in the driveway. Karen must have arrived with him, as her car was nowhere to be seen. I took a hammer and a cordless drill and punctured all the tires, making sure they were all flat, and I didn't forget about the spare tire, leaving a hole in it, just to be careful. Feeling satisfied, I continued to smash the headlights and windows of the car. Taking refuge in a neighbor's house, he called Carson's number, using a towel to muffle the sound. When Dottie answered the phone, I introduced myself as a concerned neighbor who witnessed a man crash her husband's car near Tim Stewart's house. After our conversation, I walked around the house and then returned to the basement with a hammer and a drill in my hands. I was determined to destroy the instrument of destruction so that it could not be found. Looking back, it can be said that my actions were devoid of rationality. If anyone had come under suspicion, it would most likely have been an angry spouse, especially considering that my own car was damaged in the driveway. Walking over to the ledge, I took my shotgun out of the sealed plastic bag I used to keep it clean and dry. The phone rang a few times, but I knew Karen was too busy to answer. An automatic reply sounded, but I couldn't make out the message I left. It was probably dotty. Her next step will be to drive to our house, which is only a few blocks away. As I headed for the door, I was surrounded by groans and grunts. Standing in the bathroom, I watched what was happening through the hole in the bathroom door. Carson and Karen were making love in our favorite position, both on the verge of climbing. I stood about ten feet away from them, knowing that I would hit the target when I aimed the shotgun. The shot hit him in the groin with a loud sound, causing him to scream and reflexively lean forward. Karen's head hit the headboard hard. The pain she must have been in was nothing compared to Carson's agony. After closing the door, I saw him jump up, scream and grab his groin in pain. 
Hastily putting the shotgun aside, I left the house, put on the panel, and walked through the backyard. I walked without stopping until I came to the next street, where there was a local pub. I decided that I deserved a few beers after what was happening. While enjoying the cold angling, I wondered how many men could shoot as accurately as me. While I was imagining what was happening a couple of streets away from the pub, my mobile phone suddenly vibrated around 5 o'clock in the evening. Dottie was on the line. Where are you, Tim? She asked. I lied. We're on the road now, in Connecticut, on Highway 84. Why would you want to know that? Dottie's response was alarming. I'm at Wilson Hospital. Carson is undergoing surgery, and Karen is in the emergency room. I exclaimed in shock. What happened? The thought flashed through my mind that they might have had an accident. But I think you can do without it, Dottie said. Okay, that doesn't sound very good, I told her. If necessary, I'll take Karen's car. Her car isn't there, Tim. It's a long story, and I don't want to tell it over the phone. It's just a warning, and I'll talk to you when you get there. I hung up the phone and thought about the situation. I was very upset because I didn't expect them to be admitted to the hospital. I returned home after dark. There were cars parked outside my house and several people were walking around. They were all perplexed about the mess in my driveway. After entering the house, I went to the bedroom to change my clothes. It was a terrible mess. The lamp and the table were overturned. Clothes were strewn everywhere. I must have damaged a vein in Carson's old bag. I thought with a grin. Carson took my wife away from me and used me. When a man decides to betray another man, he better be prepared for the consequences. I arrived at the hospital around 8 o'clock in the evening and immediately went to the emergency room. The vultures there seemed almost glad to see me, as if my pain brought them joy. I spent the next 15 minutes filling out forms and confirming insurance, all the while being furious. Why is everything in Spanish? This is America. We speak English, or at least in something similar to English. I finally found Karen. It struck me how pale she looked. She smiled faintly at me, then looked down at her hands, nervously fingering them. Are you okay, Karen? I asked. Do you have a headache? I have a headache, Tim, but the doctors are very careful. They want to make sure there's no brain hemorrhage or anything. I'm starting to feel better. Karen replied. Did you bring me any clothes by any chance? She asked. I'll be discharged soon. No, Karen, I didn't take anything. Can't you just put on what you were wearing when you came here? I answered, perhaps a little sharply. Where are your clothes? I asked furiously. I wasn't wearing any clothes. I must have fallen and hit my head in the shower. The last thing I remember was going to take a bath. Then I was loaded into an ambulance. I wasn't wearing any clothes, she whispered. It was incredibly awkward. It probably was, I agreed. What happened to Carson's car? Why is she standing in our driveway? Where's yours? Why is our bedroom a mess? What happened to Carson? Karen pleaded. I don't remember anything, Tim. Please don't ask me any more questions. I have a headache and I feel bad. Me too, I sighed, feeling that I was starting to get disappointed. Why don't you just rest? I'll be here to take you home when the doctors let you leave. I turned around and started looking for Dottie. A few minutes later, I found her in the next room. When I approached her, she greeted me with a grim smile. He's on the mend, Tim. He had to have his left testis removed, but is now resting peacefully. If he survives this night without complications, then tomorrow morning he will be transferred to a standard room, Dottie whispered. God, he lost one egg. I exclaimed. How did this happen? I couldn't get a logical explanation from either Carson or Karen, Dottie replied. I got a call from a man who introduced himself as your neighbor and reported that someone had damaged Carson's car in the driveway. I tried to contact Karen, but she didn't answer. Then I left a short voice message and went to your house. When I arrived at the scene, I found Carson in his car. A concerned passerby stopped and offered to help. He informed me that Carson was running around the car with no clothes on and screaming. Then he got in the car and said he was going to the hospital. I asked if Karen had said anything, to which Dottie replied, 
Nothing coherent, Tim. She was holding her head and moaning in pain. When I helped her sit up, I found a big lump on her head. Since our arrival at the hospital, I've been mostly with Carson. I informed Dottie that Karen doesn't remember anything. While we were waiting for the news, we drank coffee and chatted incessantly. Carson mentioned that he and Karen had lunch at a sushi bar. He thinks they ate spoiled sushi or someone put something in their food, Dottie informed me. I've had cases where I've eaten bad food, but I've never lost my memory from it, I said. Did he say that his car crashed and Karen hit her head because of the sushi? I asked. That sounds pretty terrible too. Without a doubt, Dottie replied with a faint smile. This is the most logical explanation because I can't think of a better one. Their actions were definitely unusual. Maybe Carson got into an accident while under some kind of influence. It's quite possible, I agreed. I started to worry that I might be involved in something serious. If Carson takes responsibility, it may spare me any legal consequences. I acted in anger and I don't regret it, especially if it helps me avoid trouble. If the police are interested, be sure to tell them, I warned. I don't think there's a law against ruining your own car. Dottie and I chatted for about an hour, and around 10 o'clock in the evening I was informed that Karen would stay overnight for observation. I wished Dottie good night and left feeling sorry for her. She didn't deserve this position, but neither did I, although maybe a little for shooting Carson in the groin. Unable to sleep, I finished fixing the sewer and put away the tools. I threw a drill, a shotgun, and a hammer into the Delaware River like the hero of a dark detective story. Although the police didn't ask any questions, I acted as if they were. After that, I tidied up our bedroom, replaced the bed linen on the bed, settled down for the night in the living room, and went to sleep there. The next morning, I was woken up by a phone call at 9 in the morning. Karen was on the line. Tim, I can go home, she said. Pick me up and bring me some clothes, please. I brought Karen home and helped her walk to her bedroom, as she was still having difficulty walking. He helped her change into her pajamas and put her to bed, where she slept most of the day. Around noon, Dottie called and said that Carson was fine and would be discharged in a few days. I didn't care about his recovery or what he would do next, as he turned out to be quite unpleasant. Shortly after talking to Dottie, Karen contacted me to ask about Carson's condition and the details of what happened. No one seems to know anything, I replied. Carson will make a full recovery, but he will always remember this incident. I watched her reaction to the news. Karen closed her eyes and shed a few tears, then fell asleep. Later, I made soup for Karen, which improved her condition. Her complexion became less pale. She became more talkative. But the real problem remained unspoken. Not a word was said about the mistakes he and Carson had made. Are you going to bed soon, Tim? I miss you, Karen said. Why do you want to sleep here, Tim? I wanted you to sleep with me. I think I'll stay here for a few nights, Karen. You need to regain your strength and memory. I don't want to bother you, I replied. With sadness in her eyes, Karen left the room. I couldn't bring myself to look at her or talk to her. I think she felt it. It later became known that the police concluded that Carson had lost control, which led to the accident. Carson did not try to convince them otherwise. He knew that any objections would only reveal the truth about his affair with Karen. It was easier for him to let people believe that he had a breakdown or that he just ate bad sushi. Karen had no desire to visit the sick Carson to cheer him up so I decided to visit him at his house the day after he returned from the hospital. When I entered the room, he was lying in bed, and Dottie was next to him. Hi, Carson. I greeted him with a smile. Come to your senses as soon as possible so that I can beat you at golf. He stared at me intently, trying to gauge my attitude to his problems. In the end, he reluctantly agreed to my proposal, but his confidence wavered. It was obvious that the recent ordeal had shaken him up, I realized that the loss of one nut made him more cautious and restrained. Karen didn't show up for work until Tuesday. I drove her to work because her car was still parked there. 
She didn't explain anything at home when I asked her about what had happened, and I thought she noticed that I hadn't raised the issue after that first night in the hospital. I wondered if I had gone too far, and if I should try to make peace with Karen. I spent a lot of time and effort on our relationship, and thought we had a strong marriage, until the day Carson invaded our family by sleeping with Karen in our own bed. I understand that mistakes can happen, and that many marriages are going through difficult times. The next evening, we gathered at the kitchen table after a long day at work. When I was sorting through the mail, a letter from the hospital caught my attention. It informed me that Karen had been diagnosed with gonorrhea and recommended that I get tested too. Karen's letter recommended that she start treatment immediately. I read the words on the page twice before handing the letter to Karen. It was shocking news. Although looking back, I remembered Carson's past statements about his preferences in women. I realized that Carson was telling the truth, that he was really disgusting. Despite this, I couldn't help but chuckle, remembering how crazy and crazy he was. Meanwhile, Karen was going over the details of the letter in her mind. I could feel her inner thoughts, wondering if there was a possibility that I had contracted the disease and unknowingly passed it on to her. Perhaps she suspected that I was unfaithful and infected her without my knowledge. If I was really infected, she could accuse me of passing the infection on to her. The unexpected twist in this situation was that I never even thought about cheating, and if I did, it would only be with the full approval of my loving and faithful wife. When she teasingly pointed out the evidence of my carelessness during a recent trip, I couldn't help but laugh at her playful accusation. It was obvious that she hoped that I had brought more than just souvenirs, given that I was sleeping in the living room. But her sly suggestion only strengthened my resolve to remain faithful to her. It seemed like she was willing to risk infecting me to win the game, not taking into account the possibility that I would remain faithful. It's funny that we often project our flaws onto others, believing that they are just as prone to betrayal or betrayal as we are. On Saturday morning I put my negative test result in front of Karen on the kitchen table. Her hand trembled as she read it. Then I handed her another document, the divorce papers. Karen's reaction was the most sincere I've seen in a while. She begged me to change my mind. Karen admitted that she had succumbed to Carson's seductive tricks, but insisted that she loved only me. At that moment, the phone rang and I picked up the receiver. Karen's screams stopped when I spoke. Dottie was on the phone. She brought up a sensitive topic. Tim, I got a report from the hospital about why Carson lost a testicle, among other things. I tested positive for gonorrhea. Have you been tested too? Dottie asked. After a short pause, I decided to tell the truth. No, Dottie, I tested negative and Karen tested positive, I replied. What a strange coincidence, don't you think? I added. Yes, it's just incredible, Tim, Dottie replied. I'm already undergoing treatment and I finally decided to end this crazy bastard. By the way, Tim, do you happen to have a shotgun? I need to start packing, Dottie. Good luck to you, I said before hanging up. Three months later, our divorce was finalized. Karen was left without means of subsistence. Since she came into our marriage without any property, I hope in the future she will be more picky about sexual relations.